listed here, Brother Alton Garrison, besides being our assistant superintendent, he leads the Acts 2 journey, the book, wrote the book uh, 360 Disciple. He's done so many things. I don't even know where to start, Brother Garrison, except to say that one of the most incredible men of God that I've ever had the privilege of, of knowing and meeting, and uh, uh, a blessing to our, our fellowship, and more than that, a blessing to us and our friend. Can we give a great North Central welcome to uh, Brother Alton Garrison? Good morning, afternoon, no, morning, it's good to be here, good to be in God's house, good to be in Texas, I'm sorry, but I was born in Texas, I can't help it, my daughter says every time dad crosses into Texas, the sky gets bluer, the flowers bloom better, the birds sing better, I said, well, yeah, (laughs) it's just like heaven, (laughs) If you're not from Texas, I'm glad you got here when you could. <laughs> not every church is exciting and blessed as this church. Did you know that? This is a great place. We've already had church once today. We're going to have church again. Pastor told me just go till I get through, so we're going to have church all afternoon. <laughs> See, I've already been told about you. That's my problem. I don't know what they meant by this, but one of the guys out in the foyer says, now, this first service was good, but this second service, they're the crazy people. (laughs) I think they're talking about crazy praise, amen? (laughs) I I, I know you're supposed to walk by faith, not by feeling, but sometimes I just love to feel it, don't you? (laughs) And uh, you got a great, great atmosphere because God's Spirit is here. And God has gifted you with great leadership, legacy leadership, present leadership. Thank God. Thank you, Pastor Larry and Debbie are great friends. Good to be with you again and all the team that's here. Aren't you glad God's given you leaders that have a passion for souls and a passion for mission and passion for what God is doing? We know God is the builder. Jesus is the builder. But I, we used to say something to the church when I pastored. Nothing falls in place but dirt. That means leaders are very important. Thank you for your investment in missions, your investment in world evangelism, your investment in helping. He mentioned that I lead a ministry in addition to other things that I do called the Acts 2 Journey Initiative. There are 13,023 Assemblies of God churches in the United States. 8,600 of them are either plateaued in attendance or declining. There's a lot of different reasons, not the least of which is Satan is the one who would like to destroy all of our churches. Amen? But not every church is gifted with the kind of spiritual vitality that NC Church has. In 8,600 of them, a million people worship in plateaued and declining churches every Sunday. Now, we already know they're faithful. They have relationships in the community. 48% of all of our churches are in what we would call rural America. Johanna and I just got back from Wyoming this week. We preached their district conference a little town, when just one pastor came up to me in a town of 3,000, a little oil field town that suffered because of the energy shutdown, 16 couples moved out of their church and out of their town because they could no longer find employment there. Now, how do you replace 16 couples out of a town of 3,000? So you can see how... Satan steals the joy and the morale right out of these churches. But if Jesus is the builder and the Holy Spirit is the supplier of what kind of power, how many believes that God can help them turn that around with miraculous activity? And that's what we do. We have a template that came right out of the book of Acts, and we help them get on a journey to health. We've right now already helped almost 1,200 churches in the United States, plus now we're getting invitations all over the world. And I'm going to Africa and to Malaysia. We're in uh, Jakarta right now with the Acts 2 journey, Indonesia, 
And, and here's our goal. Would you pray about this? I know you don't know a whole lot about the details, but, but, but pray. Our goal is to see 1,000 people trained to help implement this Acts 2 template. And we believe those 1,000 with a very easily could touch 100,000 churches around the world. Amen. So that's our goal. That's what we're believing God for. You say, well, that's a lot of churches. Our own movement, the Assemblies of God, has grown from 300 churches when we started 104 years ago to three, 377,000 churches around the world. Every 95 minutes, a new church is formed somewhere on the planet. Every 37 seconds, somebody comes to faith in Jesus Christ in an Assemblies of God church somewhere around the world. Amen? <laughs> 377,000 churches. To put that in perspective, that's, that's more churches than the 10 times more churches. 10, are you listening? 10 times more churches than there are McDonald's in the world. And we serve better food. <laughs> I mean, I'm not busting on the Big Mac. I'm just saying the bread of life is superior to anything. <laughs> Come on, somebody say amen about that. <laughs> and so thank you. This church, uh, your pastor's leadership, you've helped finance 10 churches to go through this journey at $2,000 a church. Thank you for your, your liberality, your generosity. And I pray that God will bless the seeds that are being sown by this church around the world. Amen. I want you to remember, at least for the next few moments, three important words today. The first word is grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's grace. You didn't earn it. You didn't have to pay for it. You just got God's grace. It's called salvation. It's called life transformation. Has it happened to you? I mean, be honest. Now, this is a safe place, okay? How many you would be willing, just by the uplifted hand, to say, I was some sort of a scoundrel when Jesus saved me? Let me see your hand. Yeah, yeah. There's a guy with two arms and a leg up back there. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just kidding. He's all right. <laughs> Aren't you glad that grace found you before the law caught you? <laughs> I wouldn't be here. My family wouldn't be what we are today without God's grace. My wife, Johanna, sends her greetings. She was born in Holland. Her dad was a survivor of the Holocaust. His dad was killed in a Nazi work camp. They delivered his, his clothes back to the family in a box, riddled with bullet holes and covered in blood, said he died of natural causes. That's how it was. Johanna's father was just a teenage, young Dutch boy when he lost his father in that Nazi camp. Then the Allies accidentally, it's a long story, I don't have time to tell you all about it. They accidentally bombed the village where he was living. They lived on a houseboat docked in the Rhine River. He heard planes. They were having Sunday lunch. He came out and saw that they were allied planes. He's waving at them, thinking they're protectors, they're deliverers, they're people that are assisting them. And somehow there was a mistake. It's called Operation Market Garden in World War II history. And they bombed that innocent village. And the bombs began to explode. And Hank Reifkogel fell into the dirt trying to protect himself. And when the bombs stopped exploding, he looked back in the houseboat. Their home was gone. He ran to the edge of the water and never found any evidence that his sister had ever been alive. And the only remains of his mother he could find wading out into the Rhine trying to look for her body. He found a little piece of scalp floating with some hair attached. And then he found her Bible. Walked the streets of that fishing village clutching the only remains of his mother he could find. Grief-stricken, traumatized, not understanding, fearful, 
And as incomprehensible as it may seem to you and me today, he was the only survivor. Everybody had died but him in that whole village. And that day, he bought into Satan's lie. Satan is so merciless. Takes situations that are so terrible and tries to separate you from God's love. And he shook his fist into the heavens, holding the remains of his mother, saying, you're no God of love to me. I make a vow that I'll never bow my knee to you ever. That's what Satan does. He'll try to tell you if God really loved you, why would he let that, this, whatever happen to you? I, I don't have time for the story, but he survives two, two concentration camps. After the war, he's sent by the Royal Dutch Army over to Indonesia to suppress a revolutionary by the name of Sukarno. While he's there, he met and married a little Chinese Buddhist girl who was raised in an occultic family. Her father was heavily into the occult. They got married 30 days after their wedding. He was deported back to Holland. She left with her new husband, left her family, never saw her parents again, and nine siblings. Demon spirits literally trailed her all the way across the water back to this place that he called home, but he didn't want to go because of all the terrible loss, the memories that were there. Grace, can you imagine? She is so bitter and angry and fearful. She can't sleep at night. <laughs> Some neighbor ladies came to her. Children were being born into the family. And she's, one of the neighbors said, Jan, you are an emotional wreck. You need a break. You need an outing. So we're going to Amsterdam. Come go with us. She thought they were going to a party, thought they were going to a bar, thought they were going to have a good time. They tricked her. They took her to a Billy Graham meeting. <laughs> She'd never heard of Billy Graham. She'd never been in church. She'd never heard anybody preach from a Bible. But Billy Graham, maybe metaphorically he was saying this, but he said, I, I, I'm telling you, Jesus is going to come down and meet with you, and he did. It was in a vision, but she saw him. Yeah, this white robe on had a scar on his. I mean, she saw it. She'd never experienced, never been in church in her life, brother. Jesus put his hand on her head, and all of a sudden she was transformed. She started weeping and crying, and, and the power of God took, and she didn't even know. And when Billy Graham gave the invitation, she walked down the aisle. A Chinese Buddhist walked back up the aisle, a Chinese believer, changed by the power of God. God's grace, amen. <laughs> I'm pretty pumped about God's grace today. I'm just telling you. I never want to lose the awe of his grace. My story's not nearly as exotic as Johanna's. Buddhism, Holocaust, Nazis, occultism, two countries. I'm from Sour Lake. I don't know which direction, but it's out here somewhere. <laughs> Not hardly anybody's ever heard of Sour Lake. You've heard of Sour Lake. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My dad was a high school dropout. Left school in the 10th grade, started working in the oil fields around here. Got addicted to alcohol. Became pretty dysfunctional. Got married to mom when he was 30. They didn't have children for seven years. Doctors said they wouldn't, so I was somewhat of a surprise when I was announced. Six months before I was born, he'd been to a somewhere out in Winnie Stowell. Anybody know where Winnie Stowell is? Down Highway 10. They'd been to a 4th of July celebration. They were on their way home, and he thought he was dying with a heart attack, thought that the last breath he was about to take was going to be the next breath. And he thought, I'm going to die, and I'm not going to see that child that I wanted to see. So he slowed the car down, thinking that if he got it slow enough, if he died, he'd just slump across the wheel, and there'd be no wreck, no impact. It wouldn't hurt his wife, wouldn't hurt me, which I wasn't yet born. And then under his breath, he prayed a prayer. It's the most unique conversion prayer I've ever heard of in my life. First, he said, Jesus, I don't know how to pray, but if you heard Mama's prayers, maybe you'll hear mine. Spare my life to see that child. In other words, to heal me. Second one, he said, if I ever take another drop of liquor as long as I live, I want you to poison me and let me drop dead. <laughs> if he 
made that promise. He'd never kept any other promises. And if God believed that promise, that was a death sentence. But aren't you glad that God's grace? (laughs) He didn't deserve it. He didn't earn it. In fact, he'd made so many errors. He had failed so many times in his approach to sobriety. But in one split second, Jesus reached down. All things are passed away. And behold, all things become new. And he was radically and changed, altered, transformed. Come on, never took another drink. He went from sot to saint in one second. (laughs) Now, I know there's a lot of different ways to sobriety. There's 12-step programs and there's recovery ministries and all that, but I'm still old-fashioned enough to believe that in addition to all of those, which are good, there's still a supernatural power of God that one minute you can be bound and the next minute you can be free. Come on, somebody praise him for God's grace. Hallelujah. You and I are going to get excited before this is over today. I prophesy that right now. (laughs) In the flesh. (laughs) I mean, God didn't tell me that's what I'm trying to say, okay? (laughs) I've just been watching him. Second word, providence. Everybody say providence. I call that supernatural scheduling. Supernaturally scheduling. Billy Graham came to Little Rock when we were pastoring. We got a chance to have a meeting with him privately with several pastors. And so we told him Johanna's story, how in the early 50s he was in Amsterdam and Johanna's mother. And he he literally actually took that story and printed that story of her conversion in the Decision magazine. It went around the world. But that One statement he made to us was so impacting because he called Cliff Bearers over and he said, listen to what Johanna's saying. 19, I think it was 53 or 54, because I don't even remember the story as well as what year it was, but it was one of those two years. He remembered it. He said we were going to go from Germany to the U.K., But the people in the Netherlands wanted us to come for a rally, one rally. And we couldn't do it. It's too expensive. We told them we don't do that. We can't do that. And he said they just kept begging and they got so persistent. We broke protocol and we dropped into Amsterdam for one service. (laughs) One service. And he looked at Johanna and he said, just think, that's the service your mother got saved in. (laughs) Somebody said, well, what if? He hadn't gone to Amsterdam. What if she hadn't been in that service? Somebody else would have witnessed her. She'd got to say, I don't know that. He looked at her and he smiled that big smile. And he said, just think, we weren't even supposed to be there. Then he winked at her and he said, but you don't believe that, do you? Supernatural scheduling. I said, God, schedule stuff that you don't even know about. Some of you are sitting in this room right now. You don't even know why you're here. You don't understand it. Somebody's watching me on Facebook Live right now. You don't even know why you tuned in. God may have supernaturally scheduled this appointment so something that's about to happen could radically change and alter your life. You're talking about grace. My dad got delivered from alcoholism in one split second. Six months later, he's has driven his two sisters who are part of a little church plant in Sour Lake. Eight ladies got it started, and they needed a pastor. They go over to Beaumont to a guy, an old Pentecostal bishop that's over there. Wasn't even the Assemblies of God. And, and Brother Harry Hodge, you may know that story. You're shaking your head. I know you know Harry Hodge, Sabine Tabernacle. And they gave their request to him, and he was telling them about how that they needed a spirit. And he, he looked up. He stopped right in the middle, and my dad's standing by. He wasn't even sitting with him. He's standing by the door, and he said, that's your pastor. My dad looked around. He said, I just drove the car. (laughs) I'm not qualified to be a pastor. And his two sisters said, he's not qualified to be a pastor. He was an alcoholic six months ago. He hasn't even finished high school. Sometimes God takes the underqualified, and he makes exceptions, and he will qualify you even when you're not qualified. Come on. If God qualifies you, there's not a devil in hell can disqualify you. Amen. Somebody is going to get encouraged today because God's getting ready to, I told you. (laughs) He said, go home and pray, and when God speaks to you, come back and I'll ordain him. (laughs) They did, and he did. Selah. 
No, we don't do it that way anymore. Probably shouldn't have done it that way then. It was just a divine appointment. I said a divine appointment. I'm kind of part of a team over in Springfield that creates all kinds of hoops for people to jump through to get their credentials. And I'm certainly not denigrating education, but I am saying that he and mom pastored that little church for 22 years. March the 3rd, we had her service, her homegoing service in that little church in Sour Lake just a few days ago. And we heard testimonies of people's lives that were changed because of the impossibility of an alcoholic transformed becoming a pastor. Lives changed. One nationally known TV evangelist sent a video and said 4,000 people average a month are coming to Christ under our ministry. And it would not have happened without the seed sown by Brother and Sister Garrison in Sour Lake, Texas. That's providence. That's providence. When I was eight years old, Dad came to me and said, you're our new pianist. <laughs> I said, I'm only eight. He said, well, the lady that was teaching you, she's a pianist. And her husband's transferred out of town, and you got, she's leaving, and you're it. We don't have anybody else. I said, but uh, I'm only eight, <laughs> and I only know one song. <laughs> and I don't think it was a real song. I think it was just a chorus. <laughs> he said, don't worry. We'll sing it every week. <laughs> <laughs> he said, then we'll sing those other songs that you don't know. We'll sing them a cappella. <laughs> you know what a cappella means. That's a Latin word that means we don't have a piano player. That's what it really means. <laughs> And he said, you just sit there on that piano bench and you pray for God to teach you how to play those other songs while we sing a cappella." He had such faith. It didn't work. <laughs> I mean, I guess God could have done it. He taught Andre or somebody, but he didn't teach me. Mother had another idea. You take some more lessons and you practice. But that's how I started. Playing the piano in church. You know, it's not just entertainment. When you're singing and you're listening and you're letting the power of the praise music fill your car, fill your home, something's happening that you may not even recognize, even without the words. If David could play away the evil spirits of Saul on a harp, don't ever underestimate. And when you are given a gift or a talent or an ability, don't shove it away. I'm called most places to preach, not to play piano. But the Holy Spirit, I was preaching an ordination service in uh, Sacramento, California. There was uh, thousands of people there. And, and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me to close that message with a piano solo. I thought, that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, who would, who would schedule it that way? We're going to have an ordination service. But that night, God impressed upon me, and I did what he's told me to do. And, and, but I still believe that sometimes when I play the piano, even like this morning or this afternoon now, somebody may get a spark of revelation that if God could use him at the eight. <laughs> and an alcoholic that had never been to Bible college, and an agnostic that claimed he didn't love God who later got saved, and a Buddhist who had been involved in a cult. If God could use all those people, maybe, just maybe, he can use me. <laughs> That's what this is all about. Amen? Before I finish this message, is it all right? Well, it's, whether you think it's all right or not, I'm going to play.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. His truth is marching on. Amen. Some people think that's just a patriotic song. No, that, that's a revival song. Amen. The end of dad's life and ministry was not quite as miraculous as the beginning. He left Sour Lake, and then he and mom went to Lake Charles, Louisiana. And for another decade, he pastored a church there. But at the end of that pastorate, dad contracted a diabolical disease. With all the miracles he had had of salvation, even in the early part of his ministry, he was up in... Uh, brought us to my aunt's house and I, he was taking us on a ride a horseback ride and a horse fell with him rolled over the top of him and his neck was broken they brought him here to the hospital in Houston VA hospital the doctor said his spine is pinched to the point of paralysis it degenerates and it never regenerates. For three months, he lay here in a hospital totally paralyzed, not even able to move a finger. The doctor said he never would. One day, while he was praying, he began to holler out, something happened to my neck. They thought he was dying. They ran in and said, preacher, what happened? He said, Jesus just heal me. <laughs> he said, Jesus walked in and touched that vertebrae and it popped when it went back in place. Now it took him a while to recover because his muscles had atrophied. And I, it, but God was such a God of miracles. But this time when we prayed, he got progressively worse. He's at the end of this eight year long battle and they thought he might not make it through another day and I was called I'd been out preaching and get to the hospital I'm walking into the hospital as Dr. Redford is walking out of the room where my dad was and on his way out he turned to me and he said Reverend you already know this but he said I'm going to tell you your father has no cognitive ability left his upper brain function is gone his lower brain function is gone he won't know you're present and I knew that he said it's physically and medically impossible for him to speak. In fact, he hasn't even made a sound, according to your mother, in the last four months. He said, it's not your father I'm concerned about. He said, it's your mother. We're going to keep your father comfortable till he passes. But he said, it's your mom. She's been a caregiver for eight years. And she's emotionally and physically depleted. And he walked out. And as he was leaving, he said, he turned and he looked at me and he said, you need to do something to help your mother. And I walked in. He left. I stood at the foot of my dad's bed, lying in a fetal position, his eyes kind of glassed over, looking but not seeing. 87 pounds draped on a six-foot frame. And Satan spoke to me and said, how do you preach faith? Well, it wasn't an audible voice, but you know what I'm talking about. He's an accuser of the brethren. He's a liar and the father of lies. And on and on it goes. He says, how can you preach faith when your father's lying here in this condition? How do you tell people that God is a good God when your dad is sacrificed and your mom is sacrificed and never made hardly any money, no retirement except a little Social Security? How, 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 do, you, how, how do you reconcile that? Look how God's treated him. And it's that same lie that Johanna's father heard when he was just a teenager. If God really loved you, why would he let that happen to you? I don't know what's going on in your life today, but I can almost guarantee you that's what's happening whenever there's pain that won't go away. When there's a prayer that doesn't seem to be answered. When there's an atrocity that there seems to be no recompense for. Christians being decapitated, babies dying, war occurring. All, I mean, Satan uses every opportunity to drive a wedge between you and Father God. That's what he does. That's his portfolio. I started quoting scripture. I didn't know what else to do. I'd quote a scripture and I'd feel better. And then I'd look at it. 
the condition. They, and Satan would amplify that dose of reality, and I'd feel worse, and back and forth. And finally, I got over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, We have a tabernacle not made with hands. It's eternal in the heavens. That old tabernacle, that tent, that, that earthly body, that tent, one day it's going to wither and just drop away, but your soul is going to live her. And I knew that if my dad's eyes closed in death in the next three seconds, he was just going to step from one plane of reality to another plane of reality. And when he woke up, he'd be in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Come on, saints. That's what being a Christian is all about. You're never going to die. You're going to live eternally with him. I got my victory. I walked outside, and mom and my sis and brother-in-law standing out there. They'd been to the cafeteria. They came back, and they heard me inside. I guess I was a little noisy. Mother says, what are you doing? I said, I've been in there play, praying with Pop. She said, why? It won't do any good. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, when you need God the most, he'll turn his back on you. She said, son, we've been praying all these years. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And now she said the communication, well, even for a couple of years, no intelligible syllables would come from his mouth. But now for the last four months or so, no words, no sound has even come. She said, he's not just my husband, he's my pastor. I need to communicate with him. He needs to talk to me. He needs to tell me everything's going to be all right. She said, that's been stripped from me for so long. She said, when you need God the most. <laughs> then she goes, it's a joke. That's what it is, she said. Then she did something I could have never anticipated her doing. She literally pointed her finger and kind of shook it at me. And she said, son, don't you ever pray in my presence again. I mean, you don't know her. You didn't know her. You don't know much about her. Just your reaction that I heard, that visceral reaction lets me know that's a shock. That's disappointing. But you didn't know her spiritual condition. See, I, I, I never saw her as a neophyte in the faith. I never saw her as a person who didn't love God, that didn't believe the Bible. I never saw her as a, as a non-Christian. All of my life, she was a spirit-empowered, faithful pastor spouse that when he fasted three days, she fasted three days. If he fasted seven, she fasted seven. She walked lockstep with my dad through that whole spiritual journey. Introverted and quiet, yes, but when you needed somebody to pray, you went to mama and she prayed and stuff happened. But now, sounds like blasphemy coming out of her mouth to me. I didn't know what to say. What do you say? Mom, you know, the glass is not really half empty. It's half full. <laughs> How trite is that? <laughs> when you're hurting, some people really don't say the right things. I'm sorry. They walk by you at 30 miles an hour with a pen, don't smile. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. That's not what you need. Not really. I just turned and walked away. I couldn't tell her a cool scripture. She knew more Bible than I did. I'm riding along 635 Highway, Freeway, 635, Dallas, Texas. I'm crying, talking to God. Wouldn't characterize it as a prayer, venting. <laughs> I said, God, my mother has lost her faith. Dad dies, he's going to heaven smooth, no problem. Mother, I mean, you know what the Bible says, and I'm, I'm, I'm extrapolating now, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The, w without faith, it is impossible. The, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. I mean, it didn't take but three scriptures for me to come to the conclusion of something happened to mother. She's not even going to heaven. I mean, I know I'm not the judge, but that's what I was thinking. You know what I'm saying? I said, God, I was frightened. I was scared. I didn't, and it's just like you hit me in the stomach. I said, God, something happens to mother. I mean, she's lost her faith. And then I just blurted out real loud. I said, God, you got yourself a big problem. <laughs> 
See, I thought she lost her faith. I honestly believe she thought she lost her faith. I mean, have you not known people? Just think, Pastor, how many people would be in this church if everybody that had ever been saved and came here came and still came, not because they moved away out of job, but they just lost out with God because they got so disappointed or angry or unbelief filled their life. I mean, they walked away from the faith. God taught us something. I mean, this is like a life lesson for the Garrison family, and I pass it on to you today. It was not, listen to this now, it was not her faith she lost. It was her hope. Did you hear me? Her hope. You say, well, I don't understand the difference. Well, let me explain it to you. The Bible says that when you get saved, you're given a measure of faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, what serves not a faith, you can grow your faith and you can build your faith. Why? In Romans 10, 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing God's word. Translate it any way you want to. So when you get saved, you're given a, a dose of faith, so to speak, a measure. And then as you believe the Bible, as you incorporate the Bible, as you walk out the Bible, as you live and become disciple in Scripture, then you grow your faith. It's the more you get of the book, the more faith you have. It's kind of an educational experience, right? It's ongoing. Hope, on the other hand, is not educational. Hope is more emotional. If faith is related to miracles, hope is related to morale. If faith is a dynamite that explodes night into day and defeat into victory, if, he, it, it, if that's the dynamite, hope is the fuse. Without the fuse, the dynamite is worthless. Hope is so powerful. See, Satan can, can alter a circumstance, but he cannot change the word of God. The Bible says hope deferred makes the heart sick. Faith is related to miracles. As I said, hope is related to morale. Think about it. Dictionary says that hope is a confident expectation of something good that's about to happen. A confident, happy anticipation. My mother's hope tank was on empty. <laughs> and I think Satan is a hope sucker. <laughs> That's his job. That's what he's trying to do is suck the hope right out. Think about the world today. Even with what we're going through right now, there's people who don't think there are answers. Is there going to be another war? Is there going to be World War III? What are we going to do? How are we going to put up with this? How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to do hope? That confident expectation of something good is being sucked out of the world. It's being sucked out of our nation. Have you ever seen such acrimonials, vitriol as we see politically today? And somehow it's encroaching into the church. We see divisions in the church today that we never saw 20, 30 years ago. Homes are being wrecked because people have lost hope. People are being wrecked because they've lost hope. How do they get that way? I don't think there's ever a, a chance in the world my mother ever believed that there would become a day when she would put her finger in my face and say, don't ever pray in my presence again. She didn't mean to get that way. She didn't want to get that way. But people look at their finances and then they, they look at their health or they look at their relationships or they look and, they, and, and, and they've lost hope. How do they get that way? How do you lose hope? Let, let us put a scriptural underpinning to this before I close. Look at Romans chapter 4. It'll go on the screen in just a minute, but if you have a Bible and you want to look at it or an iPad or iPod or a phone, you want to look at it, it's okay. But let, let me just, before I read it, let me just give you the history, just a little context. This is a little overview of a story that's told in its entirety way back in Genesis chapter 12. If you've ever been to church, you studied Sunday school, you know a little bit about it, you heard the name Abraham, right? Who was Abram, and then he became Abraham. I'm just going to call him Abraham, not worry about the transition point. But I can tell you that when he was 75 years old, God gave him a big deal promise. <laughs> 
and said, you're going to become the father of a promised son. And through that one birth, that son, you're going to have so many descendants like the stars in the sky. He actually visualized it for him. And the sand on the ocean shore that you're going to be called the father of many nations. That's a big deal. We wouldn't be here today if all that hadn't happened. Now, I don't have time to unpack that for you, but trust me, it's a big deal. When you get to Romans chapter 4, verse 19, they are 25 years down line from the promise. Now, he's about 100, and she's 90, about 90. He's not denying reality, but here's the key. You got to be careful when you have stuff happening like my mother faced, like Abram, Abraham is facing, you make sure that you don't react just to what you see. It doesn't mean you deny reality. Look at him. He did not deny reality. He didn't weaken in, weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. So he didn't deny how old he was. That's not the key to victory. He just had a different perspective. Let me prove it to you. Look at verse 18. In hope, he believed against hope. Somehow he's got a focus that doesn't look at the reality of the moment, but it's looking at a higher perspective. Remember those 12 spies that Moses sent for a reconnaissance? into Canaan. They were at Kadesh Barnea. Ten of them came back and said, the cities are too wall, the terrain's too rough, and the giants are so big we look like grasshoppers. <laughs> Two, Caleb and Joshua came back. They said, with God, we're well able to possess the land. They weren't discouraged at all. If I'd have been Moses, I'd have said, hey, can't you guys go where these ten went? I mean, you can't believe you guys have such a different perspective. These guys have fake news. Wake up. <laughs> Fake news. <laughs> what do you say, Martha? <laughs> uh, fake news, and these two have a positive report. Moses must have said, I don't know, it's not in the Bible, but did you not see the size of those giants like these guys saw? And Caleb and Joshua, <laughs> don't you see the size of these grapes? <laughs> Some people are giant conscious. Other people are grape conscious. Why? It's a matter of focus. So how did he maintain a focus that would be different from the minority report and the majority report? Look at verse 17. As it is written, I've made you the father of many nations. That's the promise in the presence of God in whom he believed. Look, watch it. Who gives life to the dead? who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hallelujah. Oh, the reason Abraham could have faith, the reason he could have hope, the reason he could have a confident expectation. Why? Because he knew that my God is the creator of all life. And if she lacked something at 90 to produce that child, God could create it. If something was broken, he could fix it. If something was sick, he could heal it. He is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. When you run out of your resources, you run into his. Hallelujah. He's the El Shaddai, the more than enough. He's the more than enough, not the El Chipo. Come on. If you put your trust in God, he has the power. Somebody needs to get your hopes up today. Your hopes are not going to be diffused. You have hope. Why? Because you got a God who can make alive. That, that's dead. Don't worry about your dead finances. I'm telling you, God can resurrect them. God can resurrect that relationship. God can resurrect that power of darkness that's over around you and make the light shine. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. That's all right. Shout a little bit. <laughs> Think I will. <laughs> you know, the, something else that'll destroy hope is when you get impatient. This was not quite as spiritual, but it's so effective. You say, well, I'm not impatient. This whole generation is wired tight. You don't think so. You let that light turn green. You don't move fast enough. They'll start honking four cars back. 
Am I telling the truth? Well, I'm not very impatient. When's the last time you stood in front of your microwave oven and tapped your foot because it wasn't working fast enough? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I watch you. You go to Walmart. You get in that line, 20 items or less, the express line. You're counting every item in front of you, that dude that's putting them up there. And when they get to 23, you'll lose your anointing for four days over three cans of beans. <laughs> Come on. We can't wait 25 years. We can't wait 25 months. We can't wait 25 weeks. Some of us can't wait 25 minutes. We want everything right now. Well, I've sowed my seed. Where's my harvest? Come on. Too many of us are microwave Christians, but we have a crock pot God. <laughs> Be careful when you retreat that. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I didn't say crack pot. I said crock pot. See, we're into flash frying. He's into simmering. He's into marinating. He says, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. Go in the city of Jerusalem and tarry until you be endued with power from on high. Come on, don't worry. My God says a day is to a thousand years. He's not on our timetable. Quit worrying about our timetable. He is going to ultimately win the victory for us. And I can tell you one day, and I don't know when, but Steve was singing about it and talking about it a while ago. We're going to stand face to face with him, and we're going to be in his presence, and that's going to be worth everything. Amen? <laughs> Here's another thing that will cause you to lose hope. When you think it's up to you to bring forth a promise. See, God wants your involvement, but he doesn't need your flesh. What do you mean? When he was in his early 80s, Sarah came to him and said, I don't think I'll be able to produce the son. But here's Hagar, my handmaid. They got in the flesh. They produced Ishmael, and we're still dealing with that today. I've given you the definition of hope. I've given you how hope is destroyed. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Let me tell you how hope is developed. May the God of hope, stop right there. Who's the source of hope? If God's a source of hope, how many believes hope's going to be all right? How do you know? God's past performance is an accurate predictor of his future behavior. Look how he treated people in the Old Testament. Now, he was certainly a God of justice, but he's also a God of grace and mercy and abundance. Even when they weren't of the best personality-wise, the children of Israel still got a lot of miracles. <laughs> they got through the Red Sea, what a miracle. When they got out there in the wilderness where they weren't even supposed to be, just an 11-day journey was all it was going to take, and it took them 40 years because of the doubt and unbelief that 10 people with fake news inserted into them. It's all there. But still God said, you need something to eat. Two quarts of manna every day for a whole bunch of people. 600,000 plus men, plus women, plus children. I don't know how many, over 2 million perhaps. Somebody calculated how much that might be, 1,500 tons of manna a day. They said they needed just to keep that bunch off of starvation. You give them that much manna to eat, you got to give them water to drink. They'll choke on the manna, 11 million gallons of water every single day they needed. God didn't do that for one day or five days or 10 days. He did it for 14,600 days, 40 years, thank you much. And if you calculate it in today's calculation, about $6 million a day, I'm telling you my heavenly Father is an abundant 
God added up 21,900,000 tons of manna, 160 billion gallons of water at the tune of $6 million a day for 14,000. Are you listening to me? If you think that you are going to go into the throne room of heaven with your little teacup and run it dry, I don't think so. Come boldly into the throne of God, for he has more than enough. Hallelujah. He is a God of abundance. He is the one that will supply. He is the source of hope. He will fill you with all joy and peace in believing. That's faith. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, so that by the power, say it with me, so by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. So if God is the source of hope, faith is the substance of hope, the Holy Ghost is the supplier of hope. I don't have the answer. He does. I said, he does. <laughs> when you like to have been a fly on the wall when Sarah went to the doctor? 90 years old. Walks in there and sits down. All these young women are all glowing and giggling. Grandma, you may have made a wrong turn. You're in the wrong room. We're having babies in here. They're giving out Geritol down the hall. <laughs> No, nope, I'm in the right room. <laughs> How are you going to have a baby? By the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> By the power of the Holy Spirit. How are you going to get your victory? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How's your finance going to turn around? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How are you kids coming back to the Lord? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How's your body going to get healed? By the power of the Holy Spirit. How are we going to reach our whole community for God? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Pastor says we can't just be spectators. We got to be involved. We got to be participants. I've got too many mistakes in my past. I have made too many mistakes. I'm not educated. I'm not qualified. I'm too old. I'm too young. You can give a whole bunch of excuses, uh, but they won't matter. Why? Because the power of the Holy Spirit uh, can allow you to do. He says we got to touch everybody that's within driving distance, and until they're all saved, this church is not big enough. Thank God for the first service. Thank God for the second service. But I'm telling you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll be in a third service. You may be in a fourth service. Uh, come on, because God is going to do what you never thought you could do by the power of the Holy Spirit. say, well, I'm not qualified. God takes the underqualified. That Bible that you read and love so much is full of nobodies God made somebodies out of. Moses stuttered. That's not a great leadership gift. Hosea's wife was a prostitute. That won't look good on your resume. Peter was afraid of death. Lazarus was dead. That'll hinder your ministry. <laughs> Elijah was... Burned out, running from a woman, hiding in a cave. <laughs> Jeremiah, great prophet, depressed and suicidal. Spent all his time looking for Dr. Phil, trying to pop a little Prozac. <laughs> no, 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 that was not in the Bible. I made that up. But it, uh, you get the picture. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Moses was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. Gideon doubted. Thomas doubted. Are you getting the picture? Moses had a short fuse. Peter had a short fuse. Paul had a short fuse. <laughs> I'm looking. <laughs> All I'm trying to tell you, if God qualifies you, not old devil's going to unqualify you. Come on. I said God can hit good licks with crooked sticks. Amen. <laughs> Four days after she pointed her finger in my face and said, don't ever pray in my presence again. Mother said, I walked into that hospital room where your father was. I was bitter. I was angry. I was lonely. I was depressed. I was hopeless. I didn't want anybody loving on me. I didn't want anybody praying for me. But she said, when I stepped inside that room, something changed. I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit. See, we believe God is so real that he has an essence about him. The Old Testament called it Shekinah. Cloud by day, fire by night, the anointing. She said, it just swept over me. She said, all of a sudden, 
Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, get ready. Your husband's about to talk to you. She said, that's impossible. He hadn't made a sound in four months. He can't talk. Doctor said, it's impossible. Holy Spirit says, I'll make a lie. That that was dead. And I call into existence those things that do not exist. She said, well, that's foolish thinking. Maybe somebody's playing a trick on me. She thought, well, maybe the devil's trying. And she had all those thoughts. But the Holy Spirit said, get ready. Get ready. Confident expectation. That hope needle began to flutter. She pulled a chair up beside the bed. Sat there transfixed. He was still in a fetal position, but turned toward her. His eyes were still glassy, but she now had a restoration of hope. <laughs> She's now anticipating something good. The Spirit was there. How's hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. She said, I was looking right into his eyes, and they cleared up, and he looked straight at me. And she said, all of a sudden, a brain that had not engaged vocal cord suddenly engaged. A brain that had not sent a signal to lips to form a word suddenly sent that signal. And all of a sudden, she said, with his eyes clear, him looking at me, all of a sudden, his mouth began to move. And in a strong voice, he said, you know what, honey? God still answers prayer. Hallelujah. God still answers prayer. The devil said he'd never talk again. The devil said he would never say another word again. But God let him preach one more sermon. Hallelujah. One more sermon. He came back even though he was brain dead. And he preached one more sermon. And it restored her hope. Hallelujah. And if God could do it once. Come on, get your hopes up. Amen. I said, get your hopes up today. It's not hopeless. It's not hopeless. Hallelujah. How many would say, Alton? <laughs> I understand this. My needle has never gotten on empty. I've never said what your mother said. Maybe you have. I trust that you have it. You say, well, my hope needle has never gotten as low as hers. That may be true. But can I suggest to you today if that if your hope tank is not full, you could use a dose of hope. <laughs> and you could top off your tank. <laughs> and I just kind of like to declare for the rest of this moment free refills <laughs> who supplies hope holy spirit <laughs> free refills <laughs> just let the holy spirit fill you if you want to pray in your prayer language free refills if you want god to top off your hope tank free refills amen <laughs> so we can focus our faith in your direction if you're here and you'd say I could use a dose of hope. I mean, you may be struggling with doubt. I'm talking about your emotional needs now. This is not your spiritual. This is not about your salvation. This is about where's your joy level? <laughs> where's your hope level? If you could use a dose of hope today, just raise your hand and say, pray for me all over this room. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You may put them down. Let me just take a one more moment. I don't mean to hold you too late, but I've been spending all this time telling you it's not hopeless. That's not entirely true. I don't mean to be deceptive. And it's not hopeless for all of you that just raised your hand. But it may be hopeless for one person in this room. You say, I don't understand. You see, on the spiritual side of the equation, remember we talked about grace? Talked about grace? You know how you activate grace, even though you didn't earn it? You still have to ask for it. You have to go first. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My dad, even though he didn't know anything about praying much, he still had to ask. Johanna's mother still had to come forward and ask. Johanna's father, I wish you could tell that story. 
She came home from that Billy Graham meeting, and she was so excited and told him about this transformational experience she had. She thought he'd be happy. He was angry. That's the God he hated. She started having home groups and started going to a little Pentecostal church, and he didn't like God, but he liked people, <laughs> and he liked potlucks, <laughs> and he would go just to wait for the meal <laughs> and the fellowship with the people, and one day he was sitting in a home group meeting and the leader said I need everybody to kneel and it was such a small group he thought I don't want to look conspicuous he forgot all about his vow that he's never going to kneel his knee and he just turned around to comply so he wouldn't look conspicuous but when he supernatural scheduling <laughs> when his knee hit that floor pow, the Holy Spirit came down <laughs> And he was totally, radically transformed and forgave every person that he committed atrocity against him. So if you're here today and you say, you know, I don't think that I have full confidence that I'm ready for heaven, that I have all of my sins forgiven. I don't know if you've never been saved or you have had some kind of glitch in your walk and relationship that you don't feel like you're connected the way you want to be with the Savior not a big deal we've all done it we've all had to say yes please forgive me and if that's you today and you'd like for us to pray with you that you would be totally confident by the time you walked out that door that you would be going to heaven if that was something you had to do today you would be totally saved and every sin would be forgiven raise your hand right now and say pray for me God bless you sir God bless you sir God bless you ma'am yes God bless you, 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 God bless you. Yes, I see him. Now, this is a big deal. <laughs> God loves you. He really does. Let's everybody stand. If you raised your hand, you've already made a declaration to God. And I don't want to embarrass you at all, and we certainly wouldn't want you to feel overly conspicuous. But let me tell you, God respects reachers. And, and if you that raised your hand secondly, if you would step into the aisle and come and stand down here, it would be so helpful that we'd be able to help make sure that you're connected in a correct way to God's grace. Come on down here. There's some workers that will be coming, and they'll help you with some literature, maybe a special prayer. I, I, but they, I, want you to, I want them to come right now. Come on. Look at this. God is doing a special work here today. I said, God is doing a special work here today. Hallelujah. Keep coming. Keep coming. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for these friends that have come forward today. Let them get connected to you. In Jesus' name. Now, all of you that raised your hand for emotional, you want to top off your tank, I don't think we have room for you to come down. There were so many of you. Would you do me a favor? Would you pray a prayer with them and pray a prayer for you? And we'll do it all together. Those of you that came forward at first, I want you to pray this prayer and really believe in your heart. And after this prayer, then somebody can talk to you about the situation. But I want everybody to pray this prayer. Okay, are you ready? Those down front, those standing back there, and if you didn't even raise your hand, feel free to join in. Don't be timid. Say it out loud. Dear Jesus, I give you my life with all of its faults, all of its unconfessed sin. Cleanse me today. I repent of every failure, of every fault, and every sin. I need you to be my Savior. Now that I'm qualified to go to heaven, I need help to live now. <laughs> Holy Spirit, supply me right now with hope, a confident, happy anticipation of something good that's going to happen in my life. I need hope today. I need joy today. I need peace today. I need confidence today. And I receive it now. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen.
And amen. Come on, praise him right now. Hallelujah, Lord. Now, those of you that came first, somebody will be talking to you. I don't know how they handle it here. Let me just say to you, freely you have received, freely give. Now, let me explain to you what I mean by that. I'm telling you, it's a universal need, this deal about hope. It's a universal need. I'm going to ask each one of you to consider to becoming a hope dispenser. You say, what does that mean? That means you're going to influence somebody else and help raise their level of hope. So take a few words maybe that I said today, a scripture that I used today. I saw many of you taking notes and just set it coffee or something and say, you know, it looks like you need a little hope. Nobody's going to turn you down on that deal <laughs> and start telling them how they could do that. Also, I brought some resources that I think may be helpful. Two things, a book that my wife wrote and a CD of me playing the piano. <laughs> but I underestimated the desire. The first service bought them all. <laughs> So I don't have any for this service. But there's a, 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 there's a sign-up sheet out there. They're just $10 a piece. You can pay, and then we'll send that to you through this church, and you'll get it next Sunday if you want it. But there's a CD that doesn't just have piano music like what I played today, but it has that story about my mother having her hope restored. And it has become a source of blessing and hope for thousands of people. They not only get music, like he touched me and something about that name and meeting in the air. They also get that story. They also get the story about my dad's healing of a broken neck, how God can take you out and how God can take you through. So that's back there. And then Johanna's story, Tangled Destinies. <laughs> you, you, can, you can look at, there's seven videos embedded in there in a QR code. And you can take your smartphone and take a picture of it or put your camera over. And my mother-in-law at 86 years old, she's 88 now. She was 86 when she made this video. And she'll tell you the story of how Jesus appeared to her in that Billy Graham meeting. My wife will tell you how God delivered her as a little girl from a demon that manifested. It's, it's unbelievable how God used a Sunday school story to help her get victory over the power of darkness. But... Jeffrey and some others are back there. They'll help you. I'm sorry that I didn't bring enough. Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare that this group will become hope dispensers to their family, to people at the marketplace, to people in the classroom, to people on the street, people they witness to, minister to, love, and just come in contact with. And I pray that these that have come forward today will find in you the peace that they're looking for in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for allowing me to be here.